welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I'm Pragya. Ignoring multiple local protests, the United States is expanding its military presence in the Philippines. We look at why people are against this and the implications for the region. The ongoing meeting of the Executive Board of the World Health Assembly has flagged the language used to discuss sex and gender issues. And there's an exhibition with an unusual theme. We bring you updates from the debates in Switzerland. And in our final segment, Russia's Chess Federation, the world's biggest, is leaving the European Chess Union for Asia. We'll discuss the latest in the divide in the chess world ever since the Ukraine war. The Philippines and the United States have announced an enhanced defense cooperation agreement, ignoring protests in multiple cities. People are against expanded military ties with the United States, but it is bent upon viewing China as a threat. There will be regional repercussions to the growing U.S. presence, which Anish from People's Dispatch has been tracking. Let's ask him about it. Anish, thanks a lot for joining us. Anish, what is the EDCA, the agreement between the United States and the Philippines in the military arena? What are they planning to do? Yeah, so this was an agreement that was signed in 2014 uh, when uh, uh, Philippines gave uh, U.S. access, military access to some of its bases for what were like a very specific set of reasons, like including uh, training and uh, logistical purposes and so on. Uh, these are not exactly the kind of conventional bases that we uh, understand. Uh, they're sort of like a temporary base access. So, but uh, in, in the current, in the way things run right now, uh, it pretty much is like giving at least uh, US uh, setting up, uh, you know, a sort of a temporary base, a proper temporary base in these uh, military bases that Philippines owns. And this is how, sort of like a new way because uh, uh, historically, Philippines had had a very uh, terrible uh, past and history uh, with U.S. military presence. We must remember that it was under U.S. colonial rule uh, in until the 1950s. And it was only uh, after that that, uh, and after that, they had uh, this colonial presence continued under the Marcos uh, dictatorship for a very long time. So during the democratization process, this was one of the things that was removed. And so to pretty much basically appease the people at the time and not to attract too much protest and anger, they had this sort of a new kind of basing agreement. Now, the thing is, like uh, at the time when the, uh, the EDCA was signed, uh, there were uh, many protests and many people had, uh, you know, and it, it wasn't just the progressive and the left wing groups. It was also a large number of, uh, you know, the more liberal, the more uh, conservative uh, groups who were also concerned about uh, how it might affect uh, sovereign decisions of the country. Uh, but uh, the understanding was that it will not go beyond what was agreed upon at the time, which was like access to five bases. That's it. Okay. Uh, right now, the thing is, uh, they are going to actually go ahead with uh, another five bases, uh, uh, access to another five bases in more strategic locations, uh, including in Luzon, uh, towards the which is closer to the Taiwan island, and also to um, to Palawan island, which we talked about uh, very recently, where uh, uh, U.S. Vice President. Kamala Harris had made a visit, and this is a, a loca This location is quite close to Philippines' dispute with China in the South China Sea. So it is sort of like these sort of uh, very strategic locations are being earmarked. We do not know the exact details of how they're going to expand and uh, what sort of things that they're going to do right now. But uh, this sort of is concerning uh, at this point, at a time when U.S. is very clearly trying to encircle China. Right, Anish, and there are actually protests against this in the Philippines, but they seem to have chosen to ignore that. Can you can you talk about what could be the aims, the strategic or other motives that both these countries have? Yeah, uh, we have to remember that uh, as much as uh, a lot of uh, criticism stand against the Duterte administration, there was in foreign policy wise, he had this sort of balancing act uh, and we're trying to not be too involved in the kind of conflict, the, uh, you know, the diplomatic and trade conflicts that uh, uh, the two giants, essentially two, uh, you know, superpowers uh, had at the time and uh, try to keep Philippines out of this conflict without taking a stand. 
Now that sort of policy is being slowly uh, eroded away uh, under the uh, under the current Marcus Jr. administration, uh, who has shown uh, more closeness to uh, the current U.S. Uh, uh, administration and also towards uh, creating close uh, ties with uh, the United States, which is concerning because over time this is definitely going to have its own impact. Uh, so even when we talk about the South China Sea dispute, it, despite it being a multilateral dispute, it is not something that countries like U.S. or Japan has any stakes uh, in the matter. But nevertheless, they are the other ones who are being more involved in this matter. Uh, there is a very clear, as you pointed out, there is a very clear um, tendency in the Philippines right now, uh, especially in the Philippines ruling class, to actually move towards or to align towards the United States and the whatever uh, kind of current conflict situation or dispute situation arises uh, between the two countries in the region. And that is concerning because this is just part of, you know, we have seen for the past two or three years how uh, the United States, not only under the current Biden administration, but the previous Trump administration, have tried to encircle with uh, expanding its military footprint in the Asia-Pacific, uh, it is not just Philippines, but also Taiwan, uh, Japan, very recently, where they're trying to expand its bases across the country. In uh, South Korea, where the president is now calling for uh, nuclear uh, uh, weapon deployment into the peninsula, or, uh, you know, Taiwan, Australia, and so on. So this is sort of like a multilateral uh, or a multi-pronged approach by the United States to expand its military presence in the region where it really doesn't have territories or any kind of stakes, but it just has uh, interest, very clear interest that it wants to protect uh, and obviously allies with very problematic past. And this is sort of the a part of that and that can, uh, you know, that will only create more flashpoint. The China's flashpoint in Southeast Asia has been almost nil, uh, despite the South China Sea dispute, but with U.S. involvement in such uh, instances can actually only aggravate whatever disputes exist and create more flashpoints in the future. Yeah. All right, Anish, thanks a lot for joining us, and I'm glad you could stay on despite the power troubles that seem to be plaguing your end of the Internet. Thanks a lot. The World Health Assembly's Executive Board is meeting in Geneva, Switzerland these days while the decision-making body of the WHO will convene this summer to pick a director general and firm up its budget, a lot of contentious and important issues are being debated by the executive board as well. Jyotsna from the People's Health Movement is in Geneva for this discussion. She brings us an interesting update. Right, Jyotsna, great to have you join us all the way from Switzerland. I think you're in the middle of a lot of very long meetings uh, um, can you tell us, you know, what we discussed earlier, you were saying that there is going to be a sort of discussion on the language when we speak about gender, when we speak about sex. What was that discussion about? Yeah, hi. So, so yeah, this is today's the fifth day of like really hectic and intense uh, meetings that are happening, not just meetings and uh, what is happening on the floor. So uh, before that, maybe if I can just explain how it is, it works here generally, is uh, that there are agenda items which are given to the member states. Uh, the countries are called member states because they are the members of the WHO. That's what WHO is, right? Um, and um, so, uh, so the agendas are being set. And then uh, after the director general presents something on that agenda item. It can be a report or a proposal or uh, a note-taking report, just noting what has happened in the last one year. Uh, every country gets three minutes to speak. So they have a statement, they respond to it. And uh, after the countries have spoken is the turn of the uh, non-government uh, related organizations, be it NGOs or other stakeholders like associations and pharma associations, etc. So that's how it goes. Um, the point is, it is, and uh, when you attend these, it is very interesting to see how the uh, the understanding of foreign policy or uh, uh, the understanding regarding sex and gender that exists within a country that comes out through in these statements. Uh, it may or may not be at times related to uh, the agenda item, but then 
it um in this time of social media and you know this creating an image at every point of time you can so you um, try to push it through so for example we are seeing and it is not only in this uh, particular uh, executive body board meeting but last year also in world health assembly the language around gender and sex is always something in uh, across all the documents that becomes a matter of controversy and uh, concern so for example there was a, a particular agenda being discussed today and um, russia very clearly said that there is no consensus among the countries on use of language regarding gender and sex we will not have that language in our document at all and these are some very important points for last year the example i'm giving is regarding guidelines for hiv uh, uh, okay. treatment and control and management and in that and, and it is very much related to uh, uh, your sexual priorities and it is the sexual minorities are worst affected the sex workers are worst affected but there also there were a lot of countries who would not agree to that language um, and I do not remember exactly but if I'm not wrong the language regarding men uh, uh, who have sex with men, any reference to homosexuality and non-heteronormative sexual behavior, that had to be taken out because countries would not accept it. And that just waters down everything that, you know, people need for treatment. U.S. under Trump administration constantly spoke against um, any reference to sexual and reproductive rights because they did not believe that because they said mm, abortion cannot be a right. So there were, though there were so many countries who would work towards it and the WHO wanted it, that language could not come. Um, the US has changed its stand now with Biden administration, it is better. But that's what you see. Uh, this uh, It might sound like dynamic and dynamism, but the problem I think is in most of these cases, then the conservatives take over because if you have right. to build consensus and this doesn't happen. So, so we are seeing it this time also in many of the documents uh, and they do not specifically relate to uh, sexual uh, 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 health or reproductive health, but still the references become a problem. And it becomes a problem because uh, then you are not letting sexual minorities and women get that attention which they do across board. So, right. yeah. Right, Jyotsna. Jyotsna, you also referred to a sort of interesting conference or a, a sort of exposition on the women who have been victims of sexual violence, their clothes being sort of on display sounds like a very controversial idea also interesting what did you make of it uh yeah so i mean that's what you feel that on the one hand you are having these discussions inside uh, which can actually uh, change the policy and these are policy matters and on the other hand who is trying to uh, build that kind of an understanding so there is an exhibition right uh, where the room is uh, for discussions um, and um, these are clothes of survivors of sexual violence and and uh, and the idea actually with who is uh, i mean what they're trying to say and and we can, uh, we will can show it on the screen so what they're trying to say is uh, it does not matter what a woman wore so the first question everybody asks is what were you wearing and it is like right. making the woman um, the way uh, as if it uh, she asked for it that kind of a thing and not really looking at the perpetrator and then you go through it and it's uh, it's quite a stressful in one sense because you see all kinds of clothes you see clothes of six-year-old children uh so that survivor like she was wearing shorts and t-shirt as a kid and uh she was uh sexually harassed at that age um you also have th there was one there is one which is which are clothes of a health worker a nurse actually and uh, so she was uh harassed uh, and she was wearing her work dress uh, of a firefighter so 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 these are the things and then i think in one sense it is good to create that consciousness because uh, these things for a lot of us have become very normative to talk about that you cannot talk about clothes when you talk about harassment but um, I refer to the discussions again you realize that probably that's not the case you still have to keep harping on these points again and again and let us not forget the WHO somewhere probably is trying to do this a bit of damage control because last year in in October uh, there was uh, uh, an accusation of 
uh, sexual misconduct at right. a meeting by a British doctor uh, against a WHO staff. Okay. Um, it is a still pending that uh, uh, case, uh, the inquiry is there, but it is a still pending. And so it is also about that image that WHO would like to maintain um and 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 there is a lot of sexual harassment across who offices there was a report actually uh, presented by uh, the director general tedros this time and it showed that even in the who headquarters where we are sitting this time uh, a lot of sexual harassment complaints have come uh, and uh, who it, it it looks like who really has to um, uh, address this problem now it is happening across their regional offices it's happening in their headquarters um so, so i think this is all mm -hmm. comes to how you treat uh, women and other sexual minorities and minorities and what do we take from here right jyotsna thanks a lot for joining us the russian chess federation has over 35000 players and 200 grandmasters but the european chess union has decided it is politically exposed because of political members in the rcf Russia has already suspended from the European Chess Union since last year when the Ukraine war began. It also lost out on chances to participate in championships over the last year. Siddhant Ani joins us with an update. So, Siddhant, good to have you back on the show. Uh, Siddhant, is Russia leaving the Union in Europe or are they being made to leave? Mm. Uh, I mean, so I guess uh, after being suspended, Pragya, they didn't. Uh, they were pushed into a corner, and uh, I think we can start by saying that the Russian Chess Federation, or uh, and before that, the Soviet Chess Federation, is a global powerhouse. Currently, there are thirty-five thousand uh, players, including more than two hundred or so grandmasters. Uh, okay. So, so, so you know, Russia and chess are like pretty uh, synonymous. Uh, the last chess Olympiad was the first major event to be taken away from Russia after this suspension came into place, both from the European uh, Chess Union as well as the international organization FIDE, which runs uh, World Chess. Uh, so Indian chess fans in that case benefited because Chennai then hosted uh, the chess Olympiad where over 190 countries participated. Now, chess has not gone as far as to ban individual uh, chess players from either Russia or Belarus. Only the federations are banned. So, so individuals are allowed to compete either under uh, the flag of the chess association or by moving to other countries. For example, uh, a, a woman grandmaster has uh, recently decided to uh, compete under the Swiss flag. So similarly, several players have moved to Europe or other parts of the world and are now competing uh, with using the, the flags of that country. Uh, but in, in the long run, I mean, what I guess uh, the war in Ukraine has done is it's created a divide between Asia and Europe, East and West, I, I think quite clearly. And uh, across sport, we've seen it. We were talking a couple of days ago about uh, Russian athletes being invited to participate in the Asian Games, uh, also being held in China in 2023. Uh, there were conversations about Russia moving its football uh, union as well from Europe uh, into Asia, because Asian countries are still uh, maintaining the line that there is politics and, and the war in Ukraine is part of that. Uh, but sport is somehow separate from it. European sports bodies and, and to a large extent international sports bodies, based on what the uh, International Olympic Committee has actually suggested, have not taken a similarly uh, apolitical or uh, non-aligned stance in this matter, uh, and they've gone ahead and, of course, uh, put bans and suspensions, etc., in place. So, uh, so it's a it's it's a bit of both. One is to look at the benefit of the athletes, in this case, chess players. I'm not sure if they are called athletes as well, but <laughs> but players, uh, I guess. But, but, yeah, uh, uh, but also uh, to put uh, some kind of pressure back on those who are imposing these kind of sanctions and bans. Uh, because if you take away Russia from, let's say, the European Chess Union, uh, then you take away uh, a country that hosts a lot of events, a country that puts a lot of money into it. Uh, the International Chess Association president at this point is also the chairman of the Russian railways, uh, Arkady Dvorkovich. Uh, and, you know, so, 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 so it's interesting how, uh, how, how this is playing out. 
Uh, but the fact is that it's it's a bit of both. They are pushed in a into a corner, and therefore they are reacting and and now moving to Asia. Thanks for joining us, Sadhan. Anytime. And that is all we have for today. Thank you for watching Daily Debrief. Do come back to us tomorrow. You can visit our website for more People's Dispatch stories and watch our regular updates on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.